The Marine Corps' war games can offer a look at the future of war, but they can also fuel dissent. Produced by Defense News and Military Times, this is the Early Bird Brief. Each morning, we bring you the defense and national security news of the day. We talked with Marine Corps Times reporter Irene Lowenson to learn more. What does it all mean for defense and security? You'll find out. I'm your host, Jonathan Lairfeld. Today is Monday, March 25th, 2024. Hi, Irene. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jonathan. So can you tell us about how the Marine Corps, which has rethought its approach to fighting in recent years, uses war games to explore the tough problems it might be forced to confront in war? So war games are uh, essentially games that try to simulate aspects of armed conflict, always imperfectly. And that's one tool the Marine Corps is using as it's trying to figure out what the future of the force will look like. So the Marine Corps is engaged in this overhaul called Force Design 2030. Well, actually, they dropped the 2030 recently, so just force design these days. There's a lot that goes into it, but essentially it's about remaking the force into a lighter, more agile force that's focused on sensing an enemy, engaging in operations close to shore, working closely with the U.S. Navy. Part of that has meant divestments of tanks, of much traditional artillery, of certain units to free up money for newer capabilities. So War games play a role in that. The Marine Corps looks at how an aspect of conflict might unfold given a scenario, given its current capabilities or its hypothetical capabilities against an adversary, uh, usually the Chinese military. And depending on how the game unfolds, the Marine Corps draws lessons from that. So here is an aspect that we need to work on, or here's something where it seems like we might be in good shape. What these many experts who I spoke with about wargaming said, there is no such thing as a war game that validates a course of action. A war game illuminates, you can you can explore issues, but a war game doesn't prove anything. And indeed, if you played the same war game uh, again with different people or the same people and just slightly different decisions, you, end up, you might end up with a different result. It is one aspect of the Marine Corps' learning about all of this. And other aspects are experiments in the field, natural experiments, so looking at how conflicts actually unfold, science. But war games have been, have been an important part, especially from early on in the process. Then Commandant General David Berger talked about war gaming as being very influential in his own thinking about force design. Let's take a step back for a second, and can you tell us both what wargaming is and what it is not? Right, so wargames attempt to simulate aspects of war. Um, They're never going to capture every aspect of war because reality is complicated, and there are so many variables that go into every aspect of war and every aspect of life. You can't model life. Certain aspects of this conflict have to be fixed or assumed away. You can get into some of those assumptions and some of the controversy about those assumptions later. But basically, a war game could take place via computer, but often it takes place with just some people in a room with some maps and perhaps some dice to simulate probability. You have basically a home team that represents the United States, and then you have a team that represents an adversary. There might be a team that represents other nations or civilians. Um, And then there's adjudicators who decide on the basis of the decisions that the players make how the game is going to unfold. And so when the Marine Corps does war games to analyze issues, these involve dozens of players and people take a week off of their usual responsibilities to engage in them. But there are also war games that are used for education. And those could just be you know, a board game that comes in a board game set and lasts, you know, an afternoon. So there are many different kinds of wargaming. 
of war games, but when the Marine Corps is using war games to inform its modernization path, those are the big analytical war games, not so much the the educational ones that teach people how to fight and how to apply concepts. So what do critics of the force design changes say about the games? Well, that gets back to the the assumptions that are inherent in these games. I spoke with some critics of force design who are skeptical of the way that these war games were conducted in terms of the aspects that these games assumed would work. So a big one was logistics, um, making sure that Marines get to the fight, are sustained, have fuel they need, have food they need. I spoke with one person who was involved in the war games who said that it was assumed that those were going to work fine, but he thinks it's a really complicated issue and it probably would not work fine. And when that falls apart, all of force design falls apart. And it's not just logistics. There, There are other things that some games apparently assumed would work out fine. So for instance, a Marine unit would not get spotted by the adversary early on. And uh, there's also some criticism of the nature of the war games in that they're classified. So I actually am not familiar with the results of these analytical war games because they are classified. There are not many details on how these actually unfolded. And for some people who are critical of the force design changes, that appears to be a sign that the Marine Corps doesn't think that its games could stand up to scrutiny. So what is the response from proponents of force design? Well, on the classification note, proponents say there's plenty of scrutiny on force design within the DOD and from Congress, and there's a good reason that these are classified. I spoke with the director of the Marine Corps' wargaming division who said, essentially, the wargames rely on information about our own capabilities, and we don't want that information to fall into the hands of an adversary. On the note of assumptions, proponents of force design say, yeah, some things were assumed to work out. And on the note of logistics, logistics is a tough problem. That's something the Marine Corps is working very hard on. The director of the Marine Corps' war gaming division said that 40% of the war games that it does these days are focused on logistics issues because that is such a top priority. So the early war games maybe were geared toward the some of the more traditional war fighting aspects of force design 2030 or force design, whatever you want to call it. And these days, the Marine Corps is thinking a lot more about how it's going to manage the logistics, which would get pretty complicated in the kind of fight it, it envisions. But also, Experts in wargaming said, wargames have to make assumptions. Otherwise, it just gets too complicated. It's, it goes back to the fact that you cannot simulate life. You cannot simulate war perfectly. There are just too many variables. And if you want to examine one variable, you have to set aside some other variables for the time being. Now, I know you said a lot is classified, but can you tell us about some of the Marine Corps' major war games? I don't know the details of these major war games. I do know that the results of some war games from before force design were a wake-up call for General Berger, who championed force design. He he said he observed some war games in about 2018 that uh, suggested to him that the Marine Corps really needed to change. What were former Commandant General David Berger's thoughts on war gaming, and what else can you tell us about current Commandant General Eric Smith's thoughts. General Berger was a big proponent of wargaming. He devoted a lot of space to it in his Commandant's Planning Guidance, which came out in 2019. He talked about wargames repeatedly in his force design documents. When he was asked to respond to criticism of force design, he would often say, we have a lot of war games that suggest that we are on the right path. The current commandant, General Eric Smith, one thing he's emphasized is that war games are a part of the broader campaign of learning. So there are war games, but then there's also various kinds of experiments and other ways that the Marine Corps is looking at force design. But he he has expressed repeatedly that he is a proponent of the force design path, and he's uh, recently back to work. So we'll see what comes from him in terms of next steps for force design, but he he has expressed a desire to keep at it and even accelerate it. And I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention another commandant, former commandant 
General Robert Neller, who was the predecessor of General Berger, who was a big believer in wargaming. And actually, there's this glossy new wargaming center that's being built at Quantico that's going to be named the Neller Center. It's supposed to be pretty high tech and allow Marines who are not based at Quantico to wargame out certain problems remotely. So you could be a Marine officer in in California and examine something through the war games linked up to the servers at Quantico. That's it for us this morning. To get more of the top stories and breaking news, go to defensenews.com slash EBB to subscribe to the Early Bird Brief newsletter. Please give us a like, rating, and a comment wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to follow us on social media at Defense underscore News and at Military Times. The Early Bird Brief is hosted by me, Jonathan Lairfield, and produced by Zimone Z. Perez. If you liked our conversation with Irene, be sure to check out her work at MarineCorpsTimes.com. Have a great day. Defense.